Uh, welcome everyone to the R Crowd Summit. I'm so happy to see all of you here. Just a quick introduction. My name is Roland. I am the managing director of uh, R Crowd for the Asian region. Uh, I'm very pleased to be joined today by a very esteemed uh, panel of uh, speakers. Each of them, each of them representing a very unique Asian country, a very unique Asian geography. Uh, before I introduce them, I'd just like to, to, to put in, uh, to frame the, the whole discussion today. So the whole discussion today is around the Asian region, right? How Asia has moved from being an adopter of technology to being an innovator and leading in many areas like artificial intelligence, like robotics, like advanced manufacturing, like payments. I'm sure you've heard many companies, you hear individual experiences of the panelists today. So I'll just introduce each of them uh, very quickly. They will each share their own experience over the course of five to seven minutes. We would like to, we would like this to be an interactive session. We would like to hear your questions, to answer your questions. It's really an experience sharing session. All right. So uh, starting from my right is Mr. Wilson Chu from uh, Paitu. I think Paitu needs no introduction. Is the world's leader in AI. Uh, Wilson works in the asset management division of Paitu, so they look at financial technologies and how that's being and all the technologies that go into deploying that. Uh, Janet. Janet Young needs uh, no introduction to many of you. She is the head of digital and distribution for UOB Bank, one of the largest banks in the ASEAN region. She's intimately involved in technology, how technology is transforming banking, um, and she is day-to-day uh, -day dealing with all the nuances of technologies. Uh, Jack Young, Jack is the chairman of the Hong Kong Startup Council. He also CEO of Ace Plastics. He's seen the whole development of the uh, Pearl River Delta region, deeply involved in, in the, the new Bay Area plan to rival Silicon Valley in San Francisco. His experience will be, much, uh, uh, will be of much use to all. Mr. Rajan Lutra. So Rajan is uh, the head of special operations for a very small company in India. It's called the Reliance Group. <laughs> They're in everything from petrochemical to telecoms to life sciences. Uh, Mr. Lutra reports to Mr. Ambani. He's very, very involved in all the developments in uh, in the Reliance Group, uh, his view from an Indian perspective will really sum up where the entire nexus is going. Uh, Professor Boji, likewise, needs little introduction. Uh, he is from the Chong Kong Graduate School of Business, very, very deeply involved in the development of China, deeply involved in the development of uh, the uh, how connecting China to the rest of the world and the rest of the world to China. So each of them brings a very, very unique perspective. So what I suggest is we'll, we'll take it in turn. Wilson will kick us off. He'll speak about his experience from a Chinese perspective, and then we'll move down to everybody. Right, Wilson, please. OK. Thanks, uh, thanks Roland's introduction. So um, uh, my name is Wilson Chu uh, from Baidu. Uh, so Baidu mainly do search engine. Uh, we also now focus on AI and uh, autonomous cars. But I'm from uh, FSG. Uh, uh, stands for Financial Service Group. Uh, uh, so we are trying to spin off from our parent group, Baidu, and become an independent company uh, recently. So which means uh, maybe uh, in the very near future, we kind of maybe listed in the uh, stock market as well. Uh, so mainly we do three business. Uh, one is the consumer loans, and the second is asset management, uh, the third is fintech. So uh, actually, uh, when we w when I get the the topic, uh, th uh, I think uh, regarding on fintech, uh, Asia is is quite leading in this industry. Uh, we see so many so many startups and big giants already into this this market. Uh, so uh, I tried to search some data on the uh, website uh, regarding on the payment. Like for China this year, uh, one hundred trillion. Uh, transaction volume on payment on third li uh, online payment uh, this is incredible and five years ago it's only like 16 trillion uh, it, it uh, doubles almost every year uh, which is really incredible now like Chinese people uh, they don't even carry any cash uh, they use just their mobile phone uh, to pay their like uh, a taxi uh, uh, underground uh, movie movie tickets almost everything, uh, utilities as well. Uh, so also, regarding on the uh, wealth management, the same. Uh, we see Alipay, uh, um, the AUM, the asset under, under management, is already reached 1.5 trillion, which is the uh, ranking after 
the ICBC, BOC, uh, it's ranking the third in four years, which is really incredible. Uh, so, um, I indeed, the regulation is like reshaping the uh, uh, fintech industry in China. But uh, as long as these giants, uh, the the Asia is, I think it's still gonna leading the uh, innovation. Uh, I think. It's going to be doing uh, more and more advanced and more and more better. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Lutra, would you tell us about your experience in Reliance, especially from a geo perspective? Thank you, uh, Roland. I think uh, while Reliance is uh, the largest private sector company in India, uh, but I think we, in many ways, still uh, behave and act like a startup uh, in most of our initiatives. And I think it's interesting to uh, be a part of this panel here because uh, uh, there is a transformation that is happening uh, which we feel uh, within the company as well as within the country as a whole. Uh, there used to be a significant uh, import of technology, knowledge, and uh, high tech uh, into India for decades. And I think from that position, we are now in a place where we are uh, driving significant innovation from within India. Uh, just yesterday, I was meeting with somebody, and he uh, did highlight something that was not very obvious even to us that a lot of innovation that's happening now within uh, India uh, for our Indian needs uh, is actually becoming relevant for a large part of the world. Uh, during the session, the plenary session that just uh, got uh, over, uh, we heard one of the speakers talk about uh, the Iron Triangle of Medicine or healthcare, where you had uh, quality, uh, price and customer experience, uh, only one or two could be met uh, by uh, any effort and uh, all three could never be met. And I thought about that, that that's something that has been almost fundamental to what we do at Reliance, where we try and make sure that for the Indian needs, for the Indian customer needs, uh, not only is the focus on customer experience, but even the quality is not compromised while the price or the value uh, is being optimized significantly. And I think that's uh, very uh, interesting that while they are trying to uh, break that uh, iron triangle within the healthcare industry, we in some ways have already uh, broken that within the digital services industry in India. Uh, let me cite a short uh, overview of what uh, Reliance and uh, uh, Geo, our subsidiary in the digital service space, has done. Uh, we uh, launched our commercial operations in 2016, and uh, we were the fastest company ever to go from zero customers to 100 million customers in 170 days. Uh, that was an acquiring uh, seven customers every second for those 170 days, and this was with every customer being validated, being verified, and then a uh, SIM card being issued and being operationalized. Uh, all that happened uh, because of a lot of uh, planning and innovation that went into the design, engineering, and execution of uh, what we call the world's largest startup. Before we launched in September 2016, uh, the company had already invested $20 billion in creating the infrastructure. We were the 14th uh, telecom, 14th or 15th telecom company to come into operations. Yet, uh, when we made the announcement, when our chairman made the announcement at our annual general body meeting, uh, we declared that voice calling in India would become absolutely free forever. Now, voice calling at that time was 70% of the revenue of the incumbent telecom operators. And it created a huge uh, hue and cry. Uh, how can voice calling be made free? How can we only charge for data? And even on data, there was a significant reduction in the pricing for the data. Now this we are talking about all the operators having 2G, 3G, and 4G networks, whereas we rolled out an end-to-end -end 4G network on LTE technology, uh, covering pretty much the entire footprint of the country right at the time of launch. And so we were able to achieve quality we were able to achieve a customer experience 
and we were able to achieve a price point, <coughs> all three, uh, because of a lot of innovation that happened uh, during the network design and implementation. Uh, we jointly with our partners like Samsung and Cisco and many others, and a lot of uh, young startup companies as well, including some from Israel, uh, we had significant innovation Then we filed even uh, more than 40-odd patents during that journey of innovating and making uh, the entire network not just scalable, but uh, having the largest uh, amount of uh, capacity as well as a very affordable price point. And this, I think, is something that we can discuss in more detail. Thank you, Rajan. So, Jack, you've been involved in manufacturing in uh, the Pearl River Delta region for a really long time. Could you just tell all of us what you've seen, the evolution, and what you see going forward? Thank you, Roland. Um, I, I run a manufacturing business. I, uh, it's a plastic processing business. I've been living in Sinjin for more than 20 years. I've seen a tremendous growth uh, and change uh, in the Sinjin area. As you also understand, uh, the Southern China is the manufacturing hub um, of the world in the past. Um, when I was uh, running the operation in the early ni uh, late 90s, uh, I tell uh, a lot of the friends will ask us, like, um, how many people do you have in your factory? And I say, 5,000. And they say, wow, well, that's a very big company. Uh, that's really, really good. And, and after a few years, uh, people come to me and say, it's like, they don't ask for the amount of uh, employees they have. It's, they, they ask, like, uh, first thing is like, who do you work for? Like, what products do you make? And I tell, I tell them, um, one of my largest client is Nokia. Oh, great, can we have a drink? Um, and lately, and when you come to people uh, ask you, what, what do you do? And it's like, mm, what kind of brands of robots do you use? Um, uh, um, and um, like, uh, what kind of software do you run? Like, and I tell them, so we run SAP and we run WeChat uh, uh, Office, like WeChat uh, Work, and they go, wow, this is cool, well, can we talk? So you can see the whole transformation of, of the business uh, in, in China, especially in the manufacturing. When I run the business, I, as you understand, from 5,000 people all the way to until today, uh, we've gone through uh, from having uh, artwork, more, more in a handwork, like you use a lot of labor, you use a lot of hands to assemble and to do things, to engineering. I've transformed the company, but most of these companies in the Purple Delta has transformed from a labor-driven organization to an engineering-driven organization. So it's all mastered by design engineering and then drive robotics to do work. And recently, there's a big trend of change also in, the, in, our, in our situation. It's all about driven by data. So now all these machines are, are with sensors that we create a lot of data and we use those data and create softwares to run intelligence uh, into running the operation. So you see the whole transformation of, of the Chinese manufacturing business and and it's also no longer we're competing within the China area. We're actually going overseas, and our competitions are uh, aboard. Especially when you when you understand the whole China governments are trying to uh, create a, a a very big bay. So you see the Silicon Bay area, you see the Tokyo Bay area. China is going to create one of the largest bay area. It's a 17 million people bay area including 11 cities. Um, right now, um, for the statistics, we're about three times uh, the size of uh, San Francisco and um, 10 times the population, but only one-fifth the GDP per capita. And what we're trying to do is to convert, in the next 15 years, convert the entire Bay Area from a GDP of $1.4 trillion to $4.6 trillion in 15 years. That's a tremendous amount of um, GDP generated out of that area. Not only so, we're, if you can have heard of the Chinese government talking about one belt, one road, um, I've slowly, slowly you see a huge transformation uh, in the way we do business. 
uh, I rem uh, from the statistics in '96 uh, uh, in Hong Kong, where I live, uh, our largest uh, trade partner for all the years has been China. So it has been consistent for years. But our second largest trade partners in the past in '96 was U.S. Very, very obvious. And then t 10 years later, 2000, oh, 2006, um, Eurozone become our second largest trade partners. And the statistic shows 2016, the year last year, ASEAN is our largest trade partner. So you will see the amount of shift of business of going over to US, now the China becoming a hub, not only for big opportunities in the, the domestic market, but it's also create a bridge to all other neighboring countries and create business opportunity. And especially for Israeli companies. So if you go to China as a hub, you, everybody has been looking into purely the China market. But sooner or later, you will find out this would be a hub for the neighboring countries um, to create a bigger business um, uh, out of the, the continent. So Jack, tell us, how many people do you, ha do you have today in your operations? <laughs> well, now we have uh, 26,000 people uh, 26, running uh, 200 factories around the world. Ask Janet to maybe share your experience or what you've seen in ASEAN. So this increase in intra-Asian trade, particularly from a financial perspective, what do you see? What's your view? Actually, it was really good for Jack to kind of lead on the fact that last year was the first year that ASEAN is the largest trading partner of China. And for those of you in the room, I'm not sure how many of you actually know what is ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Actually, that's also the place where my bank, UOB, is uh, front and center of the entire network. So UOB, we founded in Singapore, 83 years, 19 countries and 500 offices, all the way into the West. But the crown jewel of our Asia-Pacific network, and we're in every single country in Asia-Pacific, including China and India, uh, actually is in ASEAN. So Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines, Myanmar, Vietnam, all sounds very far away from you because it's a collection of an economic uh, community. Right? But instead of one common currency, this is a market of 630 million population. But the important thing is, in the last five years, real GDP growth grew on an average of 6%. Where else in the world do you have that consistency as a market where the population of, uh, the population of 630 million is at the cups of being able to have the consuming power, the consumption purchasing power that the Chinese and increasingly, of course, the whole of uh, Asia Pacific, which is a developed market, is gravitating towards in terms of their investment dollars. So traditionally, for those of you who know, Japanese companies, Korean companies, and all of the US multinationals, everyone that you saw in the first plenary was investing all across Asia. In the Nestle, and all of them have been early adopters. But the important thing I wanted to, to sound up is, why is innovation and the adoption of innovation so powerful in Asia? I think from a Singapore perspective, from a UOB perspective, we see that the hub itself, which is in Singapore, and of course around us with the hinterland, is starting to show that businesses, small and large, are investing big time in technology. Nothing is more apparent than the amount of investments that went into startup. And if I take just the finance sector, the amount of money that went into fintech in 2014, fintech investment in ASEAN was only 27 million. And last year in 2017, just three years, it's gone up to, at the end of September, 338 million. More than, and you can multiply, in, a, in just less than three years. And that has fueled the growth of everything because finance is an enabler. Finance is just not a sector. Finance goes into funding, 
lending. Finance goes into deposit, into wealth creation. And banking supports all the sectors, whether it's ag agriculture, <coughs> medical, or consumption, e-commerce, retail. And that itself is the reason why I think uh, the Monetary Authority of Singapore has wanted to promote the fintech hub in Singapore and last year in November hosted 23,000 global visitors to Singapore and UOB was a proud sponsor of that uh, event alongside many others and we saw artificial intelligence, all the topics that we talked about, blockchain and then mobile payments and mobile payments actually the big adopter and the big uh, um, uh, uh, innovation came from China. And we can talk a lot more about how artificial intelligence is applied and big data is applied in the world of finance. But in the case of UOB, we support all of these and we're here in the Israel Eco Startup System because we, we understand the power of connectivity. We understand that we need to connect the individual to the small business, to the large companies, we need to connect money from the West, the smart money, to the smart users and the smart businesses. We hope that we'll see you know, in, in across uh, the region. So that's, uh, that's my story. Fantastic. Thank you, Janet. So the, the whole focus on, on technology, maybe if I lead that in to uh, Professor Bo, who's a uh, uh, leading figure in academia. Uh, when I was growing up, every one of my friends wanted to be an engineer. Right, so when I was in school in the 80s and 90s, everyone wanted to be a mechanical engineer, they wanted to be an electrical engineer. The next generation wanted to be computer scientists in the, in the 2000s. And then after that, everybody wanted to be a banker. Right? So have we seen any uh, change with this whole focus on technology that we've all been discussing? This whole, uh, um, the, the whole uh, focus in many, many industries, whether it's from traditional industries like petrochemical to telecom to, to advanced industries like artificial intelligence to traditional banks. From the world of academia, what is the, the view? Has, has there been a shift in the production of talent for that industry, the desire for, uh, to pursue certain paths? What, what do you see, Professor? Well, first of all, good morning, everybody. And I hope you're still awake. Uh, I arrived this morning, and I almost missed this session because I have to speak in London for an important uh, uh, keynote speech. And uh, the room was full of people. And I see the room is not full here. I, I ask myself, what's the problem here? <laughs> and the ticket yeah, last night was sold out within 24 hours. The British people are now increasingly need Asia. So this is a trend, which I'm going to talk about later on. But answer your question directly. Uh, we do see the change and the shift in terms of the sectors, innovations, in the Asian countries. Now, if you look, uh, look backwards a little bit, by the 1820 in Asia, it's, Asia is the largest economy in the world. China take up 33% of the global GDP in 1820. India take up 16%. And European take, as a whole, 27%. America is only 2%. So world has things changed. You got to see that now in Asia, we are moving not just in the manufacturing sector, but now we're moving into service. We're moving into financial service big time. This morning, I was very happy arriving here because I took a taxi from my, you know, to come here. And at the end of it, you got to pay, right? So I take on my credit card. And I say, well, I don't have cash. This is it. He said, no, I don't have a, a machine to take it. I said, that's wonderful. That means I don't pay. <laughs> so I didn't pay, you know, at the end. Because I say, it's not my problem, my friend. It's your problem and your country's problem. <laughs> you go to China, we don't have this problem. You go to Asia, we don't have this problem. It's your problem. You got to tear your government to solve this problem, right? I'm coming here to this conference. I thank you very much. You give me a very good, interesting story to share with the audience, right? So uh, there's lots of change, change into service, change to be centered around, you know, serving the human being. That's why AI is very active in China. That's why blockchain is very active in China and in Asia as well. I was in India for the blockchain conferences. 
And there's a lot of talents per year. In Asia, in the past, we send the best talents to the United States of America, where Donald Trump is serving as president now. Now, I don't mean anything else, so please don't laugh. Now, now we keep the best talents. The best people go to Tsinghua University, go to India Institute of Technology. If you cannot get into the India Institute of Technology, then your next option is MIT. So MIT belongs to those who failed artily at India Institute of Technology. Is that true? I would think so. You would think so. <laughs> Did you graduate from India Institute of Technology? I have an engineer. Say yes. Say yes. <laughs> OK. So I also happen to you know, teach at the Tsinghua University. And I see so many talented people. There are many international students who couldn't make it you know, to Tsinghua. They come from international, go to Tsinghua. Yeah? So you see, things are changing dramatically in the Asia. And I must tell you one thing that will bring all those audience to this room. That is, one of our students from our business school, our business school mostly deal with top executives, uh, his name is called Jack Ma. Maybe you know him, maybe you don't. Okay, doesn't matter. He's quite short, by the way. And he said one thing. When you are facing the trend, the future trend, there are people at the very beginning, they look down at the trend. They look down at the trend. They, they say that, oh, this is, dumb. this is nothing, you know. And then after a while, they got confused. Why? Because they saw so many people are doing it. They're like, what? I thought this is not going to be the future. Why everybody is rushing to it? They got confused. They still don't take action. And after a while, they feel, my God, everybody is doing it. I'm behind. Three stages of failure of not understanding the trend. And you're not one of those because you are here. And some of the people outside may be one of those. <laughs> Please tell them. Because Asia is a trend. I just told you, in 1820, Asia are the largest economy in the world. And Asia is moving up the curve to lead the technology innovation. In the past, the whole world copied Asia. You know, anything from India, you know, it's great, amazing. Oriental, what is the word of Oriental? It means something very mesetic, very sophisticated about technology, you know, all those, right? So in the past, everybody copied China. So this subject, we hear, someone is shaking their head, I will talk to you afterwards, okay? <laughs> I will convince you before you leave this room, otherwise you stay here, okay? <laughs> so I tell you something. If you do this, you follow the trend. Asia is the future, why? Because we have a huge population in India, in China, in those Asian countries. And not just that, we have a very low GDP per capita. Poverty is an opportunity. Do you see that? In good America, everybody's rich. You have three car in a family of three people. You can't buy more. You go to Asia, this on average, you know, family has only one car. They still have room to grow. You understand this concept? So that's why you need to go. You know, I used to work at the Wrigley Chewing Gum Company. When I joined the company, I asked one single question. What's the per capita consumption of chewing gum in America? It's 179. And what is this number for Chinese? It's 17. Yeah, it's better than that, 17. So if you understand where I'm going, if average Chinese would chew the same amount of the chewing gum like American do, we would have five, six times of the GDP of American size. That's what we're talking about. This country, Israel, are taking too much American-centric approach in the past few decades. I'm saying this to you without, you know, I'm not afraid of you because I'm a friend of Israel. I've been here many, many times for 10 years in the past. So I know you take this hard, hard, harsh, you know, argument. But I want you to start a shift to Asia, really. That's why I fly all the way here. I'm paid, you know, I'm not paid, okay? 
well, not paid by the President Xi Jinping or by your Prime Minister. You know, I'm here as academic to tell you future trend, you must see it. Otherwise, you were missing out in a big time. Thank you. Thank you. We'd like to hear from you. We can probably take one or two questions before we round it up with uh, another interesting discussion. Is there anyone who would like to lead on the front? Please. Sir, please. Right, so that's a very good point, right? Because before this conference, I was connecting all of us via WhatsApp, right? And Wilson, who's from Beijing, um, couldn't access it while in China, as you well know. He couldn't access his WhatsApp. But we had thought that once he crossed the border, once he got an Israeli signal from partner, that he would be able to. But guess what? He can't. His Chinese SIM card doesn't allow him to access WhatsApp. So I think, Wilson, can you kick us off from there? How do you overcome that situation? The rest of the world on one ecosystem, China on the other ecosystem, where is the bridge? Right, according to his question. Okay, this is a really a good question. Because for, for me, uh, after I graduate, uh, I take my undergraduate in China, in Zhejiang University. So, uh, after that, I actually went to the US, uh, to Johns Hopkins. So uh, actually for myself as well, I doubt sometimes why uh, Chinese blocks so many things. Uh, to me, it's, uh, it's, um, it's kind of, I, I don't understand that as well. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, indeed, indeed. Uh, but uh, you know, when we uh, uh, organized this group uh, through the WhatsApp, uh, I didn't notice that I, when I uh, uh, go outside of uh, China, I still cannot access to it. So, uh, but I find one thing very interesting. Uh, I attend the meeting yesterday Everyone said, let's add on WeChat. Uh, they don't say, let's add on WhatsApp. Uh, so I think uh, WeChat is going to be the, uh, the, the bridge to this gap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why, not, why not everybody use WeChat? Uh, because we already have like 9 million users in China and all over the world as well. Uh, so maybe... 900 million, sorry, sorry, 900 million. <laughs> yeah, already. Uh, so yeah. Maybe you can try that. Yeah. WeChat, sir, please. Regarding investing from uh, China and from the United States, we have a, a clear understanding that investors from China are looking to make, a, a, how do you call it, like fast money. And to invest in a company, they can take a, the technology, translate it to China, and sell it. While here, from the startup, That's, that's a good point, right? As John Maynard Keynes would say, in the long term, we are all dead. But it... <laughs> ah, sorry. The gentleman was saying that, that the definition of long term change. So as an investor, you try to invest for the long term, you have to take the 
five year view, whereas in China the long term probably means tomorrow. Right? <laughs> so how do you how do you bridge that gap where the Chinese, particularly the Chinese, and I can attest to that, want to get rapid growth, whereas as an investor, you're investing for five years and you're looking at solid long term uh, potential. So how do you bridge that gap? I think Professor, could you weigh in on that? The whole psyche well, thank you, because uh, we happen to have a program called China Star to deal exactly like that. So this is not a commercial, by the way. So uh, the, the investors in China indeed have what you just observed exactly right, because in China you need to understand that the, the market is very turbulent. Everybody go goes there and make money very fast, so they have lots of pressure from their peers. You know, if they invest in your project, takes five years, 10 years, and, and it doesn't see anything, then they have huge pressure from, you know, their LPs and from, you know, their peers for that. So I think uh, the best way to deal with this kind of the situation is to, in your business model, you cannot change Chinese, by the way. You know, you can say that, no, I'm not going to deal with you. I still go to America, and that's fine. But market is huge. It's great opportunity there. So I think in your business model, you need to build in both short-term and long-term you know, objectives so that Chinese investors can see that they can start to, to, uh, to leverage the commercial space in China to, by working with you. And that adaptation ability is very important. You, know, you have to adapt to, to the situation. We come to Israel, we adapt to your culture, your situation. So, um, and uh, it's also our, our schools aim to educate. We send a lots of CEOs to, to Israel to learn. And everybody in China, in the, I mean in the top level, they, they know you're a starving nation. They read the books you know, about that. So that's our uh, aim, to educate them to have a little bit of long-term view. By the way, Chinese are enormously long-term. Okay, our mind is enormously long-term view. We're talking about hundreds, thousands of years. But for time being, because of the great opportunity we see, so we tempor temporarily you know, give up in some areas a long-term view, focusing on the short-term view. So don't miss this thing. Chinese enormous long view. Okay? We're much more long view than American, for instance, at Wall Street. They do quarterly earning release. You know, they look at every quarter you know, to figure out whether they should continue. Uh, so you know, we can talk more about that. Please, I think uh, yesterday uh, we had a press conference where we uh, launched or announced uh, the the incubator with our crowd, and I think it's uh, just a small case in point to your question. Uh, now, Reliance Industries, Motorola, and our crowd are partners along with Yusum in that uh, fund, uh, which is or incubator, which is an early stage incubator. I think uh, this is the kind of uh, strategy that uh, companies from India, and there are many other examples other than Reliance as well, uh, that are looking at. Uh, from an Indian perspective, just to add to whatever uh, was said about the China's perspective, uh, we believe there is a significant opportunity for Israeli early stage investing, uh, early stage startups to really adapt their products and their services for the Asian market. India being a case in point that at least I can cite about. Why are we investing in such an incubator is largely because we believe the market opportunities are there in India. Uh, the connectivity, the digital infrastructure is all next generation is already there. If you can have your products and services oriented around the Indian market rather than the more developed market, there is a vast opportunity uh, lying out there for large number of subscribers or large number of customers uh, which are there. And I think uh, it's not about the short term versus the long term, which uh, you cannot change some uh, core uh, DNA of, of uh, let's say, nations. At the same time, we do believe that uh, you can look for the right kind of companies that have a long term perspective. So, Roger, you raised a very good. I'm afraid we may not have time to take any more questions, so the, the team will be here to answer. I'd just like to draw everybody back to one point. We're all in Israel, and I think Rajan raised a very good point. We're all in Israel. And so we need to draw the discussion back to Israel. So if you think about the traditional Israeli ecosystem, the exit route for the Israeli ecosystem has been the US. You, know, you have to go to the US, and from there you reach the rest of the world. Right? Over the last five years in particular, there has been a notable shift. And I, I'd like to hear from the different panelists where they see this going. Because from an Israeli perspective, if you're a startup, and if you do not need to use the US as an exit point, can Asia be an exit point? Can you commercialize there? 
and then go to US. So, so how do we, so Rajan, you raise a very good point. Could you maybe carry on from there and say, where do you see that uh, India and Israel have a very interesting relationship? It's now on the high point, so maybe if you could share with the audience how, how you see that evolving. Thanks. Uh, so I think uh, the opportunity that we see is what uh, Professor just mentioned about, that the need, the demand, and also the ability to consume uh, is significantly high in, in Asian countries, and again, uh, with a specific focus on India. Uh, just as an example, uh, while there are already uh, more than 900 million subscribers uh, of telecom services, uh, there are still a large number of people who are using feature phones, for example. So again, from an innovation standpoint, we had to customize or adapt a phone that was a feature phone because many users are not comfortable using technology uh, of a smartphone. And we had to devise a completely next generation of a voice interface. Now that voice interface enabled this phone to be talked to or people who are not familiar with uh, high technology in, in the lower strata of the, or the rural India uh, this phone was meant for them to have the ability to look at the internet uh, or do all the uh, things that you would like to do, yet have a very affordable and a very next generation of a 4G feature phone. Uh, the point I'm making is that if the need and the opportunities of India are better understood, and that's one of the reasons why we are here in Israel, uh, we would like to explain what are the opportunities of the Indian market for Israeli companies to understand and then adapt their pro, uh, programs for the Indian market. I call this uh, Israeli innovation adapted for India because that's the real opportunity to, if you have an early uh, understanding of that need and that demand and then consumption opportunity, then you can align your products or your focus, your uh, segments into uh, that uh, meeting that demand. The second part being that you really have uh, a lot of Indian companies, uh, if we saw the, uh, the business delegation that accompanied uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, recently, there were 130 people from their side that came uh, to Delhi and Bombay. And I think in, within uh, uh, the Bombay part where we were uh, part of that, uh, we had taken about a 45-member team to meet with the Israeli companies and to engage with them in different sectors. And I think as part of that, we have uh, now a large number of Indian companies that are looking for uh, early stage uh, in or even more mature products and innovation from the Israeli ecosystem for the uh, Indian market to partner with them as such. And Thank I think you. that really needs to be looked at. Yeah. So, Janet, you've been a very early supporter of our crowd, very early supporter of the Israeli <laughs> ecosystem. So maybe in, in 30 seconds, could you just tell everyone your view on where you see this going? I think spend time. Spend time to connect with the right ecosystem partners because Asia is... You, you can say the elephant in the room is China or the elephant in the room is India. But actually, Asia has tremendous opportunities. Uh, my take is, originally our crowd fly Dennis Bunn. You see John Medved, right? He showed, Dennis Bunn flies, right? Dennis Bunn is always on the flight. Dennis Bunn is always sitting in a plane somewhere flying to Asia. But it's gone to a stage where there's so many opportunities. They have put in Roland. Roland is now full-time sitting in Singapore. And the ecosystem requires you to connect. And when you understand, you will be able to navigate. Whether through Singapore, so for example, in the case of UOB, we have this team called the Foreign Direct Investment Team. Every single country, whether India, Malaysia, Indonesia, China, Hong Kong, the team is on the ground. We understand who you should do business with, not not what you should do business with. In Asia, who you know is the first and the most important thing to get deals done, right? Because once you know who, you will know the what, the why, and the how, and everything else. So you need to invest time to build the ecosystem partnership. You can't do Asia just from afar. You need to do Asia in Asia. And having the right partners is what I think. And to his point, in the case of Asia, last year is the first time m there are more millionaires in Asia than there are in the US. Okay, so that's where the wealth creation is. 
Thank you, Janet. And on that ringing tone, that means our time is up. I'd like to thank everyone for a very interesting discussion. Thank all of you for your attention, and I'm sure everyone here will be glad to interact with you as you meet in the halls and for the waffles. Thank you.